Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Again, our guest today is Peter Docker. And first, I want to thank my friend and fellow podcaster, Chris Burnham, um, the host of the Lean Leadership Podcast, for making the connection and the in introduction. You can also hear Peter uh, has already uh, appeared on, on Chris's podcast. But I think we're going to have a really good discussion here today uh, as well. Uh, Peter has been in, in, in his life, um, there's, a, there's a long list, uh, a professional pilot, military commander, project manager, negotiator, teacher, speaker, consultant, and father. So before I tell you a little bit more, uh, first off, welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And hearing that list makes me chuckle, actually. It, sometimes it doesn't feel like it was all me, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said in the book, you, you meant no... Um, no offense to your children for putting father at the end of that list. No. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think fatherhood or parenthood is one of the biggest leadership challenges that many of us face. I, I certainly believe so for, for me at any rate. Yeah. So um, Peter is the author. Of the, so the book that I mentioned, um, I've had a chance to, uh, to really dig into this. It's called Leading from the Jump Seat, How to Create Extraordinary Opportunities by handing over control. So there'll be a link to where you can uh, get that book in the show notes. So we're going to be talking about concepts from that book today. Uh, Peter was previously the co-author of the book, Find Your Why. He was formerly uh, what they call a founding igniter at Simon Sinek Incorporated. Um, Peter draws on his 25-year career in the Royal Air Force and over 14 years spent partnering with businesses around the world to inspire others to, as he describes in the book, and we're gonna talk about here again today, this phrase, lead from the jump seat. So uh, I think we'll have some opportunities to connect the dots to lean leadership concepts. There's a lot um, in, in the book that I think is uh, familiar, compatible, a lot of great ideas here. So the theme today definitely um, is on leadership. And you know, of course I mentioned Royal Air Force and you've heard Peter's voice, um, so. I'll ask a question. Some listeners are looking or looking to get confirmation. Where are you joining us from today? <laughs> well, as you can tell from the accent, uh, I, yes, I'm in the UK. I'm in England. I'm west of London and west of Oxford. West of Oxford, the city famous for its colleges, university. Um, and I live in a small village about 40 minutes drive west of Oxford in the beautiful countryside. And it's just starting to get dark here, but uh, yeah. that's winter for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's one other biographical detail I um, wanted to, to ask you about. I, I, I'm an engineer. I think we, we probably have a lot of engineers in the audience. Mm. And you, you started your education pursuing engineering before choosing to, uh, to join the Royal Air Force. I was wondering if you had any, any thoughts you'd want to share about that progression and, and shift in your Well, ambitions. yes, that, that takes you back. Good heavens, it's just over 40 years ago when I first started at university and I, I started a double degree in e electronic engineering and computing. So this was back in the early 80s, good heavens, a long time ago. I, I think what I particularly remember about that time, Mark, is that I knew nothing really about those subjects. And any electronic engineers out there, uh, I'm sure you're very good at physics and very good at mathematics because that's sort of a prerequisite. I have no real physics background and I was mediocre at best at mathematics. But the, the reason that I, I chose those subjects, that double degree, was because um, at the time I felt it was my best opportunity to get a job afterwards that was well paid and I wouldn't be dependent on anyone else. And more than that, I, I could support my parents because we were pretty hard up at the time. Both my parents had lost their jobs. And so, yes, I wanted to support them. So that's the reason I started that degree. Um, uh, and perhaps I was overreaching a little bit. I, I don't think I had, the, <laughs> I may not have had the academic ability to uh, graduate in electronic engineering, who knows, but uh, right. I, I left actually about two years into the four year program um, to join the Royal Air Force. And that was a, another crossroads in my life at the time. Because I mean, a lot of it comes down to, as, as you talk about in the book, uh, a sense of purpose or a sense of calling. And, and at the time, that, that sense of purpose, um, that opportunity to help others by joining the Royal Air Force was really important, right? Yeah, I, you know, we, we talk a lot about 
purpose in this realm. And certainly the time I spent with Simon Sinek and co-authoring Find Your Why, that, that was focused on purpose. But right. I wanted to go a little bit deeper uh, in Lean from the Jump Seat, the latest book, because, well, it, it struck me that there are some things that are so important to us that we will move forward even in the face of uncertainty or danger mm-hmm. and or even when we don't know what the answer is, you know. Uh, and what brought this to mind was a couple of years ago when I received a phone call from my wife, Claire, and she was somewhat shaken and told me that she'd just been involved in a car accident. Oh. Now, I was on a call with some colleagues at the time. Uh, it was during the working day. Um, but as you might imagine, I dropped everything and went to support my wife. It was only mm-hmm. a couple of miles away. And thankfully, she was okay. But what I reflected right. about that moment was that the, the surge of energy inside me that occurred at that point, I didn't know what I was stepping into. I had no idea, but I took that step forward regardless. And that's the thing. When we start to identify those things that are deeply important to us, it gives us that energy, that drive to move forward. Now, for many of us, that includes family. But I raised the question myself, what's the inquiry around, well, what else is deeply important to me? Now, I mentioned something about going to university and why I chose that, those degree subjects. It was because something deeply important to me is not being a burden on anyone else and being able to support others as and when I can. Mm -hmm. But then I mentioned I reached that crossroads. It was in 1982. I was mid-course at university and something else in the world happened. And that was the islands in the South Atlantic called the Falkland Islands. They were invaded by neighboring Argentina. Now, the Falkland Islands have been a British territory for many, many years, and the people who live there consider themselves to be British. And at the time, I remember it was nothing to do with politics, but I felt incensed that someone was imposing their will on others. And that had a similar surge of energy inside me, so much so that I chose to leave university mid-course to join the Royal Air Force because I felt In doing so, I could be part of an organization that in future could help others who could not help themselves. And the way I express that these days in terms of a driver deep inside of me is the the theme of mutual respect. That is deeply important to me. Mutual respect, not being a burden Mm -hmm. on others, family. These are three of things that are deeply important to me that give me this energy inside, the non-negotiables. And why that is so valuable is that when we're moving in the face of uncertainty or leading when we don't know the answer, these drivers, deeply held drivers, give us a handrail. Mm -hmm. They they give us something to help guide us. And uh, I think that is so vitally important in the the realm of leadership um, and, uh, and leading others, leading ourselves and also leading others. You, know, you talk about mutual respect. I mean, that, that's maybe one point where I'll connect some dots to um, the, the, Toyota, uh, the Toyota way culture and what they would describe as respect for people and respect for humanity. Yeah. And that is very much um, a two-way street or in whatever directions. This is not demanding that employees show respect to their boss. The mutual respect, I think, yeah. starts with leaders um, respecting their employees. And, uh, that's that's one real common theme. Yes, and and so it would come as no surprise to you, Mark, that uh, that really resonates with me. Uh, the the Toyota approach, and uh, also the a lot of aspects of Japanese culture. Uh, the, this notion of respect and um, other sometimes intangibles like honor or um respecting our, our legacy and our, mm-hmm. our past you know it, it all right. resonates with me i think it's deeply important um and it's one of those things that, that drives me forward yeah so uh, to dig you know deeper into the leadership concepts you talk about in the book leading from the jump seat there's an aviation term there so sometimes we we're, we borrow from um toyota or manufacturing and we've got to learn some of the lingo um, you know, first off, tell, tell, give us the context of the jump seat. I mean, I know the term, but I don't really know what that means in the context of a plane. Well, it, it links back to a, a story that helped inspire the writing of this book. And I, I think as human beings from time immemorial, 
we have we have learned and passed on knowledge through stories. You know, they, they tend to be memorable, and this is certainly a story that was memorable for me. It goes back some years now. I was a senior officer in the Royal Air Force. Uh, I was uh, a pilot, and part of my role, I would check um, pilots on my squadron to make sure they were up to to standard. And on this particular occasion, there was this young guy called Callum, and he'd been a, a co-pilot for first officer for many years. And he was just completing his training to become a captain. Now, that involved about six months of training, digging deeper into the aircraft systems, learning more about uh, the, the backgrounds of the aircraft performance. So as they would then be able to be in charge of the aircraft, be responsible for it, flying, in our case, 140 passengers around the world, anywhere, in all conditions. And so this was a big step. And the final stage of that process was for someone such as me to act as Callum's co-pilot as he flew us from A to B to C to D uh, to, to do a final check. And on this occasion, we'd flown from, from London over to Washington, Dulles, and then on to San Francisco. And San Fran is a very busy place. And Callum did a, a fantastic job flying us in there. And we, we taxed it in, shut down, and the passengers got off. I turned to Callum. I said, great performance. Very well done. Uh, I'm signing you up. You're good to go. We're going to stay here the night. But then in the morning, we'll have a full packs load and we'll be flying back to Washington. You'll have a regular co-pilot with you. I'll be down the back with the other passengers. Yeah. And as I'm sure you appreciate, that's a great moment to be able to sign somebody up. Uh, they've mm -hmm. worked hard for it, and it was a wonderful moment for Callum. So we stopped there the night. The following morning, I was just flicking through a magazine as Callum was doing the pre-flight preparation. He came to me. He said, excuse me, sir, and the sir bit's important, not for my ego, but the fact that I was several ranks above him. Mm -hmm. And we're in the military, so there's this hierarchy. But he came to me, he said, excuse me, sir. He said, it's very busy during rush hour in the morning at San Fran, and it's not a place we, we fly out of regularly. Can you come and sit on the jump seat for our taxi out to help look out for other aircraft mm -hmm. and um, make sure we, mm -hmm. we taxi the right way, et cetera? And I said, yes, of course, Captain, no problem at all. And it, it struck me this was – showed great courage on behalf of Callum because, remember right. – He'd had somebody watching over his shoulder for the past six months. This was his opportunity just to get on with the job. But no, he was, if you like, connected to a higher purpose, which was the safety of the aircraft and everyone on board. So he asked me to sit on the jump seat. And the jump seat is on the flight deck of most large aircraft. You have the captain's and the co-pilot seats. And then immediately behind, you have a third seat, which is usually empty. That's the jump seat. And crew members like myself can, can sit there and, and grab a ride home. So I, I sat and strapped in. Great view out the cockpit. You can see everything. And uh, Callum fired up the aircraft. We started a taxi out. He did a great job. He didn't really need me, but, you know, it, it was a good call on mm -hmm. his behalf. Mm -hmm. We lined up on the runway. We cleared for takeoff. We thundered down the runway. And we just got airborne. We were three, 400 feet above the ground when we had an emergency. And Callum immediately was wrestling with the controls. And in that moment, what I chose to do in the next couple of seconds, two beats, that's all it would take. Mm -hmm. What I chose to do would fundamentally affect whether I and the 140 people on board would survive or not. And here's the thing. I chose to do absolutely nothing. I sat there with my hands in my lap quite calmly as Callum sorted out the problem. To intervene would have not made sense. I just signed him up the day before as fully qualified to fly this aircraft anywhere in the world. So if I'd had any doubts that he could handle the situation, I would have had no business signing him up. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. all I needed to do in that moment was not to lead, but to become a great follower. Callum needed to feel that I had his back and I needed to get out of the way and allow him to do his job. So this coined the phrase for me, leading from the jump seat, because this is what actually happened on that flight day that day, but also it's a metaphor for, for life and for work. Mm -hmm. You know, at some yeah. stage, we will hand over control. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Either as the CEO will retire, uh, if we're a team leader, we'll switch perhaps to another team, or as we mentioned earlier, parenting, you know, our kids grow up, leave home and start leading their own lives. 
And so it's inevitable that we hand over control. Leading from the jump seat is all about how do we lead in the moment, intentionally setting other people up so as they can, they are fully prepared to take the lead. Uh, jump seat leadership is not about retaining or increasing your own power. It's about leaning in a way that you lift others up and empower them so they can carry forward those things that you feel are deeply important, those ideals that you share. Yeah. So that's the whole starting point for jump seat leadership, really. And the, yeah. the metaphor is carried on throughout, throughout the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's such um, a compelling story to to start the book, and there is there are so many things that we could sort of you know unpack and dig into related to that story. I mean, for one, you know, I think of of Callum as being that new officer. I'm sure he felt a sense of pride, I mean, rightfully so, of accomplishment and having yeah. this opportunity. But I appreciate you use the word courage, and I think that applies the courage to ask for help, and I think. Combined with that is the humility that's there Absolutely. to ask for help. And so I was wondering what, what your thoughts are between military culture or other organizations. How do we create a culture that invites that? That 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 mm -hmm. that is, I think there is a connection to Toyota, sort of this idea of speaking up, pointing out problems, asking for help. You know, if in doubt, ask for help. Yes. Is part of the culture there. What, what do you think about creating a culture where it's safe for people to speak up that way? Well, I, I think the, the military certainly doesn't always get it right. However, there are, there are some basics that have served uh, professional military organizations around the world for, for many centuries. And certainly where it, it starts is you have a group of people who share common drivers, not all the same, but common drivers in terms of, for example, putting others before self. Uh, during the 2003 Iraq war, I, I led the best part of 200 people flying large, unarmed, undefended air refueling aircraft. Our job mm -hmm. was to give away gas to fighter jets. Mm -hmm. And we tended to get shot at from the, the ground defenses, which, um, you know, was a bit unsettling at best. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yet all of my people instinctively got into those aircraft and did what they did, not for themselves, they overcame the fear because actually for the love of the people wearing similar uniforms to them on the ground who were reliant on the air support that we would provide. And if they didn't get that, they would likely die. And by people on the ground, I'm talking about British, American, and Australian forces who had never met but were reliant on us. And, you know, it's very natural to, to sense fear but we do have a choice how we respond and right. it can truck your courage and we can use that courage to source ourselves from a place of love for something. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of my Iraq war example, it was the love for fellow servicemen who depended on us. And so any organization, when you're very clear on what the mission is, what the purpose is, the vision, where you're going, that gives a context, a framework within which people can operate. And then touching, Mark, on what you're talking about, the humility side of it, um, again, the military gives us, uh, gives us some useful cues here as to how we can create an organization that embodies humility. Um, when a, a junior officer passes out of officer school, when they graduate, they will often be put in charge of people who are junior, junior in rank to them, but senior in years and senior in experience. And so uh, humility is built in because those young officers who thrive are the ones who turn to the people on their team and ask for their input, ask for their view, drawing on their collective genius mm -hmm. to help solve the challenges they're facing. That's what makes a young officer successful. The, the, the guy or the girl who says, right, this is just follow me and charge. Well, that's not sustainable, yeah. you know. Um, so it is built in through the training to, to learn how to ask questions and to listen mm -hmm. and to gain the insights of your team. And I think from what you've told me, Mark, you know, Toyota is very good at nurturing this, this culture. You've got a, um, or Toyota have got a, a focus on what they're trying to accomplish. Um, particularly around, for example, quality. 
um, again, from what I, I, I know, mm -hmm. I'm no expert, mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. is, is universally known, I think, the Toyota approach. Um, but then they encourage people to, to speak up right. and offer that feedback. And for leaders or people in positions where leadership is expected to have the humility to listen. But then the, the third thing, which I think that crosses over well to companies that thrive, is the sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Now, in the military, we all wear a uniform. Um, I should say I left back in 2007, so I'm a bit out of date. But nonetheless, yeah. you know, we all wear a uniform in the military. And that is the starting point for creating a sense of belonging. But also there's a great ethos based around squadrons or regiments or a ship if you're on the maritime side. And that nurtures that sense of belonging. And the reason that is so important is that when people feel they belong, then they are more likely to contribute. Mm -hmm. They go above and beyond whatever their contract of employment says, you know. Yeah. Um, that comes from a sense of belonging. And we nurture a sense of belonging by showing that we care. Right. So, you know, all these things are present in the military when at their best, even though they may not express them in those terms. And I think if we look at organizations in the commercial world, such as Toyota, if we had a look through that, those lenses of you know, being a, committed to a higher purpose, um, having humble confidence to listen and not allowing ego to get in the way, and nurturing a sense of belonging, we would see all of those things present in organizations such mm -hmm. as Toyota. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's uh, a theme of, you know, Toyota talks very specifically about leading with humility. Um, mm. Listening to people, asking questions, um, not as as leader, not being the one with all the answers. And, Absolutely. And and I think to your story there from from being literally in the jump seat, I, I compare and and you know I give credit where there are times where my inaction is honestly me freezing and not knowing what to do or not knowing what to say. You being a, a military veteran, um, you know, uh, experienced and, and, and tested in times of, of war. Um, the, the, the one thing that's fascinating there is the, the choice to not intervene in a very high pressure situation. Like that takes a real strength of, of conviction in that moment under pressure. It, it does. You know, and the, there is a difference between a reaction and a response, mm. uh, which I think is useful in this, uh, at this point, Mark. You know, we react is often visceral. You know, um, it, it's often emotionally based. Now, that can be useful if we're jumping back from the, the, the road as the car is coming along. Uh, you know, that reaction is useful. Yeah. Um, but reaction generally takes the form of uh, fight, flight, or fight. Sorry, freeze, flight, or fight, doesn't it? Right. You know, this is this is commonly understood. And in certain situations where our life is not immediately on the line, those reactions of freeze, fight, or flight do not necessarily serve as well. Right. Picking up on the aircraft example again, I can tell you that when the fire alarm indicating an engine fire goes off on an aircraft flight deck, that catches your attention. Right. Um, there's a big red light and a chuffing loud bell <laughs> that tells you, you've got an engine fire. Now, for the untrained pilots, the chances are you would, you would freeze. Mm. You know, there's nothing to fight as such. Uh, you, you can't run away because that would really upset the passengers. Uh, and so... <laughs> The, the propensity is to, to freeze. Now, that is not helpful in that situation. So what do we do? We train pilots so as they can respond. And a response in this situation, in this example, is one that's been built up by engineers and pilots sitting in a nice, comfortable room with coffee and all of the system uh, design uh, details and checklists to identify, right, what are the actions that we need to take in this situation? And so when that is then drilled into pilots, they can react to the situation, you know, in that quick time frame that otherwise you'd be freezing. But
but they react using a response. And a response is a considered series of actions. Mm -hmm. Now, we can translate that into the commercial world as well. You know, let's take something which is uh, often at the forefront of uh, many businesses. What happens if we get a data breach? Um, well, that is something that we can predict. We can sit down and carefully work out a checklist of actions to take. And then that is the one few time, one of the few occasions when command and control, if you like, telling people what to do is, is valuable um, because it's pre-considered actions um, through a response rather than a reaction. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of things that can translate to replace that freeze instinct with something that is useful. Yeah. Um, and in that, that moment, that, that, that pressure packed moment, or it, you know, in the book you allude to uh, you know, a, a similar crisis moment, the, the quote unquote miracle on the Hudson, um, yeah. Captain Sullenberger and his co-pilot um, Skilling, who, who I, I try to give credit to because Captain Sullenberger always emphasizes that that was a team sure. in the yeah, cockpit. Absolutely. Um, but when they had that event, I mean, they, they, in my, my recollection of hearing them tell the story is that they did not have a precise checklist for what happens if both engines were taken out by birds just after takeoff from a New York airport. But they did have checklists about trying to restart the engines, evaluating where to land, like the, the skill in the moment was piecing together yes. those plans. But I, I, I think that's, that's a brilliant insight of, um, you know, kind of trying, try doing our best to anticipate likely events, even if we can't anticipate every exact detail. I, I agree. And to pick up on that, Mark, because I think you make a really valid point, uh, in flying and also my military experience, we, we used to plan a lot. We used to plan for every eventuality. Uh, when I was 25 years old, I was fortunate enough to be one of the few pilots to fly our prime minister around mm. the world. And boy, oh boy, did we plan to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. You know, we would look before a trip, we'd look at all the different permutations of runway departure, arrival, weather, where we'd be parking, because the aim was to arrive on time to the second no matter how far we were flying, that was part of the, the job because it was a diplomatic state visit. Uh, and so we used to plan everything. Now, sometimes something would occur on that flight, which we had not anticipated. But that was OK, because having planned all the things that could go wrong, it gave us the confidence and also the capacity, mental capacity to deal with yeah. those things that that. that arose that we hadn't predicted. And the same with Captain Sullivan, uh, Captain Sully there. They, uh, like every commercial airline crew, will have practiced single engine failure, double engine failure, relighting drills, and also significantly ditching drills to ditch the aircraft in, in water. Um, they had quite a few things going on there, which all came together, which resulted them in them landing on the Hudson. But I, the point I think which is really worth bringing out of that story is that chances are they may not have met one another, that crew, until about an hour and a half before takeoff. And yet the predetermined responses to emergencies, which they'd all trained in beforehand, allowed them to take the actions they needed, which resulted in the great, great outcome, uh, outcome they had. And yeah. Um, I want to shout out to the cabin crew. Yes. You know, I, I tell you, from a pilot perspective, up front on the controls with that locked door behind you, it's easy. Huge acknowledgement to cabin crew, often very young as well, um, who have to manage and take care of all those passengers who are scared out of the wits. And uh, huge respect for the work they do, often undervalued. And, and that, that was my mistake for not also acknowledging them because Captain Sullenberger does include them does. as part of that team for helping evacuate the plane in an orderly, quick, yes. effective way. Um, yeah, many yes. heroes. That uh, and hats off to Tom Hanks for portraying it so well, I <laughs> yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, did a great job there.
Um, but you know, there, there's a parallel just to connect dots there because I, I, checklists are used a lot in healthcare, inspired from I think a lot in many cases aviation practices. Um, Doctor right. Atul yeah. Gawande, uh, his famous book, The Checklist Manifesto, that talks about the application of checklists in different settings. Um, checklists are a form of you know what Toyota might call standardized work. You know the the language we would use in in the lean terminology, but the way you articulate it is something I've also heard from Toyota folks is that when you have these game plans and, and procedures or checklists that frees up the mental capacity to deal with the unexpected, almost the exact same words that, that I heard from you. So it standardized does. work doesn't turn us into robots. That's often a fear. Right. Like we're not eliminating thinking, but we're trying to make sure there's maybe not mental fatigue from mm -hmm. making all sorts of decisions all day long that we, we, we save um, that capacity for something unusual occurring. I agree. And I, I would add to that as well. And sadly, I can't remember the engineer's name. Uh, I, I was watching a documentary some months ago about the early moon landings and the first Apollo mission to land. And as uh, I'm sure you'll recall, as the, uh, the lunar module was descending towards the surface of the moon for the first time, they had all these alarms going off. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of them was uh, around low fuel, and mm -hmm. they had a whole host of other um, issues, largely centered around the computer being overloaded, mm -hmm. uh, I, I seem to recall. Mm -hmm. But I, I saw this documentary, and they were interviewing one of the engineers who was at uh, uh, Mission Control, and he said something quite remarkable. He said, when they got this one particular alert out of many, it was the worst thing that could have happened at that stage. It was the worst possible fault that could have happened. But here's the remarkable thing. He said, when I got that alert, I relaxed. Hmm. He said, because I knew that nothing worse could happen. <laughs> and we'd planned for it. And we knew what to yeah. do. Hmm. And I, I paused and reflected on that because that shows the the mental capacity that we are given by planning how we're not just going to react to things, but respond to things. Um, we've done all of the thinking beforehand, and that frees us up to um, be creative or um, uh, address those things which cannot be predicted. Yeah. Um, coming back to your jump seat story, um, I mean, there's so many uh, aspects of this that I think are interesting. You know, back to the idea of, well, you know, for, for one thought that comes to mind first is when you're talking about the sense of belonging, like that is very strong in healthcare. Yes. There may be on one level, a very strong sense of belonging to one person's field or discipline. Nurses feel a sense of belonging with other nurses, Cardiothoracic yeah. surgeons feel a sense of belonging to other cardiothoracic surgeons. And on some level, there's belonging to physicians as a group and belonging to healthcare mm -hmm. providers as a group. But then there's the question of, and sadly, I think a lot of times people don't feel a sense of belonging to the organization that they mm -hmm. are working at. And, you know, I just think of one recent example, I think of a very positive example. Somebody I interviewed recently. Uh, in a different series that, that I host called Habitual Excellence. Um, Dr. Eric Dixon, who is the CEO of um, UMass Memorial Health in, in Massachusetts, he has really done a lot as the chief executive officer to um, strengthen people's sense of belonging, not just to the sense of purpose and the patients, but sense of belonging um, to the organization in different ways. Um, during the pandemic, they were uh, an organization that did a very Toyota like thing in terms of saying, no matter what happens here, there will be no furloughs, there will be no layoffs yeah. as a way of trying to you know, deepen um, the sense mm -hmm. of loyalty to the organization. But then as, as Dr. Dixon um, describes, you know, him expressing his love and using that word love mm -hmm. with employees. And, and, and that's a word like, I don't know, I think of like that, that becoming an, even if you mean it in a platonic sense, like you would be sent to human resources yes. if you use the word love at work. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that word up because I, I think it is so important. Uh, there's a chart behind me with uh, three letters on um, LCF. You know, everything that's important to us, everything 
is driven by one of two things. It's either driven by fear or it's driven by love. Mm -hmm. And if it's driven by fear, that, well, first of all, it's not sustainable. Yeah. But what that drives is we tend to close down and focus on ourselves. Right. We tend to have a view of the world of scarcity right. uh, or winner takes all. There can only be one winner and that's going to be me at all costs. And we start to forget about other people. And the ego often takes its fall uh, and, and takes the fall. Or flip side of that, we could take a step back and become meek you know that's all fear-based and it's not sustainable it doesn't serve Mm -hmm. but we always have a choice and that choice is love and the way that manifests itself in organizations and business is first of all we have a view of the world that is full of possibility and opportunity rather than scarcity where we have the capacity to think about others and being in service of others rather than thinking about ourselves. And instead of ego, we are driven by humble confidence. And humble confidence is where we're absolutely resolute where we're going and the outcome we're seeking. I'm willing to take the decisions when they need to be made, but we have the humility to listen to the input of our team. So linking it to your your medical example there, Mark, you know, particularly during the pandemic, would it have been easy to be driven by fear? Of course it would. And, you know, in extremis, you would have had nurses and doctors not pitching up to work because of the fear. But actually, they used that fear as a warning flag and acted upon it by choosing love instead. Yeah. And that's the love for the fellow human beings that needed their help. And the thing that connects love and fear is the C on the chart behind me, which is courage. Mm-hmm. You know, courage cannot exist without fear but it can only be sustained through love. Mm -hmm. And so it's perhaps very clear in a medical field where there is this common bond of helping other human beings, but it can be generated in organizations in other sectors too. Uh, And I I, I think that the love word is something that um, we do well to talk more about, Mm -hmm. particularly as we move into this year and beyond. You know, I believe that there's gonna be a greater focus actually moving away from things like pay and benefits and more towards how people feel at work, whether they are cared for, whether they are respected and whether they are lifted up or not. And if they don't feel that, if they don't get a sense of that and the sense of belonging that that follows, then I think they, they vote with their, their feet and they, they leave. Right. Right. And, you know, maybe in, in our workplaces, I mean, they do use the word love in healthcare quite a bit, but, you know, we, we could translate, we, I think if we talk about um, translating that to like a sense of deep respect, yes, it's kind of the same thing, even if it's a different Absolutely. word. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was a, a Greek philosopher who said the word respect uh, was created uh, for the times when we, we felt we can use the word love. So the, there is a link. Yeah. Um, uh, between the two. So yes, respect actually absolutely works. Yeah. And, you know, you, you use that phrase, humble confidence. And, and this is a topic sometimes we've, we've, it's come up with other guests, like, can somebody become more humble or do the humble become more confident in, in to, to create sort of this, you know, this level of, of humble confidence? Mm. I think there's a, an ongoing dynamic tension, um, certainly with you know, take my, myself. Um, I I know that I can sometimes lack the. You might find it difficult to believe, but I lack the confident side of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, I can easily retreat. In fact, there is a a story in the book about when I took over command of a squadron in the Royal Air Force. Uh, I had so much time for the guy I replaced who everybody seemed to love him. He was a very ebullient chap, center of the, the, the party, and um, everybody thought he was great. I thought, how the heck can I measure up to that? And I mistakenly thought, well, perhaps I just need to be like him, be like Ian, you know, which big mistake. And it took me a while to, uh, to recognize that. And I talk about that more in the book. Um, but, you know, I, in the face of very, very confident people, I, I can 
actually take a step back. That's my natural instinct. So that's something I need to work on because mm. becoming meek doesn't help anyone. And meek sure. is at the extremity of humility, I guess. Mm -hmm. So humble confidence, the, the, the choice of words there is very intentional because mm -hmm. we need to work on <laughs> recognizing uh, where we are strong, having the confidence in our strengths, whilst also making sure it doesn't get too far ahead of our humility and willingness to learn and the curiosity that keeps us on the, the, the straight and narrow there. Mm -hmm. Equally, if we go overboard on humility and become, well, less confident about our strengths, then again, that doesn't help us. It's a dynamic tension that we need to maintain to ensure that one doesn't get ahead of the other. But for me, that's part of the fun of it and the part of the, 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 the constant development in terms of leading myself and leading others. So, and there's one other element of the story and the situation that that you were in in the jump seat, um, you know, kind of a leadership under pressure situation. That I think a lot of people face maybe in other settings, the short term survival need, the need to fight the proverbial fire or, you know, in, in the yeah. moment versus um, and, and I think maybe you use the word stands. So mm -hmm. maybe I didn't correct me if, if I'm not using you know, your, your framework correctly, but we would have one stand that says, uh, I, I love everybody on board and I care about their safety and we need to survive. I take that seriously. Then there's also the stand that says, I've signed off on this person. I believe in them. I'm, I need them to develop. And um, what, what, what happens under, under pressure if, if some of these stands or beliefs or goals come into conflict right there in the moment? Well, yes, you can have, um, a, a, I call it a conflict of commitment. Uh, and uh, first of all, of course, this point event of the emergency out of San Francisco, there is a lot that happened before that in terms of the relationship I have with Callum, the guy in the, the, uh, the seat, uh, in the captain's seat, in terms of the training and the skill set that we developed in him, you know, th this this wasn't from a, a standing start. There was a lot of history there, a lot of investment that had been made in Callum that led to him being signed off for a, a, as a captain. So I think that's very important because the, there is a tendency in uh, in many companies I've seen where people are given accountability for things and they haven't been given the the, the training or the skill set to right. to help them deal with it. Yeah. You know? right. Um, so th there was a lot that, that went on before then, but let, let's take it a little bit further because I think what, what this can lead to is when do you take back control, mm -hmm. you know, and later on in the book, I talk about the four red lights moment. And this was when I was in the captain's seat and I had a, a junior pilot as the co-pilot and we're flying into Gander in Newfoundland and the weather wasn't that great. The visibility was good, but it was quite blustery. And when you're flying into a major airport, you have what are called the precision approach uh, indicators. And these are four lights, either on one side of the runway or both sides of the runway. And those four lights can each shine either red or white. And if you see two red lights and two white lights, it means that you're on the correct approach angle, the, the correct glide slope as, it known, as it's known. If you see three white and one red, you're going too high to land safely. If you see three red and one white, you're going too low. And if you see four red, you're way too low and you could hit an obstacle uh, on the approach path. And this uh, uh, John, I, I changed the name, John, I think I called yeah. him in the book, was flying the approach. And uh, we started off with two red and two white lights, that, that's good. But then it started to go to three reds and one white. I were going too low. And I, I said to him, I called it out below the approach path, below the slope. And he acknowledged, but he shouldn't, he, he should have taken action, which was to apply a bit more power on the engines, but he didn't. Hmm. But I allowed him to continue because we we're still okay. It was still safe. We we're still a way back. Um, but then it started to go into four red lights. At that stage, I called it out again, going way below the glow slope. Mm -hmm. He acknowledged but didn't take action. So I, I didn't even then take over control. I reached across, I pushed the throttles forward a little bit, which was the action that was needed. And we regained 
the correct approach uh, slope. Right. And we landed safely and we talked about it afterwards. So here's the thing. What is your four red lights moments? And by that, I mean, if I'd allowed it to go on any further, it, the situation would have gone beyond that when I would have been able to recover it myself. Uh, yeah. But it's important to go to that limit, to know that limit, because if I'd taken control from John at that moment, I'd have pricked his balloon of confidence. He wouldn't have learned. Mm. And that could have taken many, many months, if not longer, to recover that. And what a waste that would have been. Right. Um, so what is your four red light moments? Does it matter if the guy screws up? That's a good question, too. Sure. Yeah. And it, it's an opportunity to, to help the person spiral up from their mistake rather than spiral down. Um, and, well, the guiding principle there for me was when does the, I think this is Star Trek, actually, <laughs> yeah. when do the needs of the many overcome the needs uh -huh. of the, the, the few or the one? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was able to recover that situation, ensuring that the needs of the co-pilot, John, was met and we didn't have a spiral down moment or prick his balloon of confidence, yeah. whilst also looking after the needs of the many, i.e. all the passengers on the aircraft, and ensuring that we landed safely. So these are the things that I, I, I think about when we have that conflict arising inside of us. Yeah. You know, what's my four red lights moment? When do I take over control? And I think what I see in industry is a propensity to take over control right. much earlier than we should. Right. And that has such a far-reaching negative effect on the other person, the situation, their growth. Mm -hmm. And... I, I agree, and I see a lot of that too. And to connect it back to Toyota, um, you know, Toyota emphasizes two things. One is people development, like not just solving the problem at hand, but doing so in a way that develops people. So um, John Shook, um, who um, had a long career at Toyota and was at the Lean Enterprise Institute, always expresses it as um, as this. He says, you know, as a leader, if you jump in, if you take control back, if you give the answer. If you tell them what to do, you've you've stolen the opportunity from that other person to figure it out themselves and to develop yes. through that learning. So I think there are a lot of more you know mundane moments in the workplace where, to your point, this is not life or death. Um, if if you give somebody the authority to do something and you fear they're doing it wrong, really, what what's the worst? impact mm, of that. Yes. There, there, there could be some settings in an operating room that are strictly life or death with the attending, supervising um, um, a resident. But there, there are many, many moments where I, I agree leaders jump in and it ends up um, circumventing the people development. Um, like you said, it, it's less sustainable or it's less scalable yeah. if the leader is going to constantly jump in and tell people well, what to I, do. I think there's another... Um, issue with that as well you know we are all well the, the whole education system and the way we enter work um molds us in a certain way you know when you go to university or college to become an engineer get your engineering degree and your your postgraduate uh you are specializing you're becoming very very good in a particular area you are then um hired because you're good at figuring out the answers mm -hmm. and that's great but then if you do really well, chances are you'll get promoted and you're no longer the person uh, doing the designs or sorting the engineering problem. You're looking after the people who are sorting out the problem. And that's where the, the biggest hiccup can occur because we love to solve the problems. But certainly mm -hmm. engineers, I've got great friends who are engineers, love to solve problems. That's what we do, yes, as right. engineers. Yeah. And so letting go of that is very difficult. But here's the thing. It's essential if we want to accelerate the team, right. because if we remain the person who has always got to be the guy or the girl who's got the answer, then we become the constriction in the pipe. Because our team can only advance as quickly as we can come up with the answer. However, mm -hmm. if instead we are guided by our stands, what we believe in, if we have the humble confidence to listen, empower the collective genius of our team, and become comfortable leading when we don't know the answer, then we're no longer the constriction of the pipe. 
and the performance of our team accelerates rapidly. And that takes a great suppression of ego. Mm -hmm. And it takes humility. And it takes the confidence to be able to put your hand up and say, look, I don't know the answer here. But let me tell you a reason it's really important we've got to figure out. And I'm going to hold the space where you collectively can help learn our way through the problem. And that's when innovation occurs. That's when um, energy starts to increase within the organization. And that's when people step up and start to lead as well. Yeah. And come up with uh, their fresh ideas and the whole organization accelerates. And that's the exciting thing. And that's the opportunity that comes with Jump Seat Leadership too. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, and again, I'm looking over your shoulder, it seems like the one response of leaders might be driven by fear. I fear that they're going to do the wrong thing, so therefore I jump in, as opposed to having love or respect to yeah. allow them to, to learn and grow and develop much yeah. more sustainable. And, and Toyota uses language around long-term perspective, making decisions that emphasize the long-term perspective, even at the expense of the short term. Now, those decisions are probably, again, not often life or death decisions. But, you know, I think of, um, um, again, back to Dr. Dixon at at UMass, you know, early in the pandemic, the price of PPE skyrocketed, tripled, Mm. quadrupled. And they made the decision, well, well, we'll spend what we have to spend to get the right personal protective equipment for our staff because it's the right thing to do, because we love them. Like it was based on these principles and stands. And so we'll figure out the financials later, as opposed to organizations that maybe said, well, we, we, we can't exceed our budget, but well, that that's our own constraint, you know, that, that would be put in place as opposed to doing, um, you know, doing what, what they did at UMass. Well, uh, and it's a different in context. You know, there are only two things in this world. There's content and there's context. Content mm-hmm. is the stuff that we do, the work that we're engaged in, and the things that we say. But content has got no meaning whatsoever without context. You know, context is like the, the, the picture on the jigsaw puzzle box. You know, without that, all the puzzle pieces on the table don't mean a darn thing. Mm-hmm. But when you see the picture on the box, you can see how they come together. Now, linking it to the example you've just given uh, in the medical environment, if the context was we've got to minimize costs in every regard, then it would make sense to um, you know, go for the cheaper PPE, the, the non-certified stuff or whatever. But if your context is, well, no, I really care for our people. And I care for my people not only because it's the right thing to do, but over the long term, this is how we make what we're doing sustainable here. Right. You know, right. if our own people get sick, then how can they care for others? So, mm-hmm. you know, if that's your puzzle picture, uh, the, the picture on the puzzle box, then you bring the puzzle pieces together in a, a, a different way. Yeah. So context is everything. And sometimes there is an opportunity to either uh, illuminate the context. In this example, remind people, look, we really care for our people in our team. So we, we've got to get the right PPE mm-hmm. or shift the context. If people are focusing on, on different things, shift it back to the context that you feel is the most generative for the long term and in service of your people and what you stand for as an individual and as a company. Mm-hmm. So um, before we wrap up, I, I just want to highlight one other thing from the book that, that I really liked. It's sort of an ongoing framework um, throughout the book, when it comes back to developing people, you talked about how Callum, as that new pilot, was fully trained, fully prepared to be accountable. Yeah. Um, as, as, as you said, far too often people get thrown into a role of, of responsibility without being properly prepared, which I think mm-hmm. is, you know, it's unfair and um, counterproductive in, in, in many ways. And in, in the book, you have this framework of, you know, being, uh, progressing as a leader. Um, Mm. one, I'm going to just read it off real quickly here. One, learning to fly two, flying three, teaching others how to fly. And then four leading from the jump seat. And, and, and I think the parallel there, um, would be applicable in in many contexts. Absolutely. And learning to fly is, is figuring out what's really important to you. You know, if we want to lead others, we, we need to figure out how to lead ourselves. And that, that's a continuous journey. But it, it starts with 
figuring out what's deeply important to you. What are your non-negotiables? What do you stand for? Um, and so typically that would be somebody perhaps starting college, university, um, that sort of age, even if they're not at college or university. But then you, you get into employment and you're really in flow. You're doing great. Well, that's you flying. But then you get promoted and you're taking care of the people uh, who are doing the work. And that's you teaching others to fly. And then finally, you're in that place where you can take a step back into that jump seat and then you'll lean from the jump seat. But here's the thing which I think is really important for us all. We can be at different stages of those four in different areas of our life. Oh, right. So, uh, for example, yesterday I had the great privilege of meeting up for the first time in over 20 years. Someone I mentioned in the book, Lieutenant General Sir James Dutton, KCB, CBE. He has been knighted twice by uh, Majesty of the Queen. Once is significant, but twice, you know, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I worked with him in our Ministry of Defence when uh, I was in the military, and I cite him as one of the best leaders I've ever had the privilege to work alongside. And uh, he has now long since retired. He's had a commercial uh, uh, career as well after leaving the, the, the military. But here he is now approaching, I think, his early 70s. And while he was very much leaning from the jump seat in his professional career, he is now learning to fly again. And learning to fly is figuring out what's he going to do in his retirement, you know? Uh, yeah. What's next for him? And so it can be for, for all of us. We might be flying or teaching others to fly at work, but we might be learning how to scuba dive. Well, we're right back to the end of the, the, the bottom of the scale again. And I, I think recognizing this, for me, it's really useful to have the, that lens to recognize where I am and anything that I'm doing in my life because it keeps me curious. It keeps me humbly confident mm -hmm. and it keeps me moving forward. And throughout all of those four stages, what gives me that handrail are those things that are deeply important to me, the non-negotiables mutual respect, not being a burn on others, helping others. And this helps me move forward, even into the unknown. So Peter, I really um, enjoyed your perspectives here between uh, the book and what you've shared with us uh, today. Um, our, our guest again has been Peter Docker. Uh, the book is uh, Leading from the Jump Seat, How to Create Extraordinary Opportunities by Handing Over Control. And uh, you can learn more about the book and, uh, and, and more about Peter leading from the jump seat.com. Peter, this has been a real treat today. Thank you um, for your time. Thank you for being a guest. It's been my absolute pleasure, Mark. Thank you for your great questions.